Okay, so you came here to see David Andrew Childress. So, <laughs> yes, and he's here. And, you know, I, I've known David for a couple, two, three years, and I can tell you he's a great guy. He's, uh, he's actually what most of us, his fans, would consider a real-life Indiana Jones. This guy has been, folks, he has been from one end of this globe to the other. And uh, when I, you know, when we try to get a hold of David, heck, we don't know if he's up somewhere in the Himalayas or down in the Andes or, you know, in the, in, in the Gobi Desert. We don't know, but uh, he's all over the place. Uh, David was actually born in France, but he was raised in Colorado and Montana, so he was familiar with the mountainous areas. And at an early age, he was interested in, in uh, archaeology and cryptozoology and, and, and what we see, what we see today something that he started when he was a young boy. And anyway, um, today he's a, um, he's a real historian. He has gained a great amount of visibility and respect uh, on the, uh, the national, or not national geographic, I'm sorry, the uh, his history channels of ancient alien spirits. So we're all familiar with that. That is uh, what, gave, what gave David the greatest uh, visibility in, in the public side. Uh, David is also the author or and or co-author of over 20 books. So he has a wide variety, wide range of, of, uh, of interests. He's a great guy, folks. Um, and you're going to get a chance to listen to him for the next two or three hours. So let me welcome David Patrick Shillers. Yeah. And uh, 
So we're, as a publisher, uh, that's Adventures Unlimited Press, and there's a catalog out there. I'd like you all to, to get one if you're interested. And then we did another spin-off thing, which was uh, our magazine called the World Explorers Club, and that's out there too. All right, well, let's get going and let's start <laughs> traveling around the world. Uh, I'm sure that this is going all right. This thing, is that it? Okay, here we go. All right. So look, I've always been interested in, in Atlantis and megalithic building and lost cities and, and lost continents, ancient civilizations. And until recently, mainstream archaeologists were saying that the oldest ruins in the world were on Malta. And it's these ruins here of Gigantesia, which is actually on an island called Gozo. And these, these ruins, and they're megalithic in Malta. The mainstream was saying that they're, they go back to uh, six, 7,000 BC. And in fact, there's a cave on Malta called the Dargalon Cave. And this, that cave is evidence of a cataclysm tidal wave that hit the Mediterranean at some point, uh, 10,000 BC. And it washed up all of these small piggy hippopotami and elephants and things into this cave in Malta. So that Malta was somehow, and the whole Mediterranean was we're all connected, and Malta was had to be connected to Sicily and things like that. Now mainstream archaeologists are saying that the oldest ruins in the world are in Turkey, at this place called Gobekli Tepe. And they're saying now that these ruins are uh, as old as, as 10,000 BC, that they're 12,000 years old. And this is really the time of uh, Atlantis, if you read Plato's uh, dialogues on Atlantis, he's saying that, yeah, this civilization goes back to about 10,000 BC. And now, that's what mainstream archaeology is telling us to. Mainstream archaeology is continually pushing civilization and, and the building, like in Gobekli Tepe, farther and farther back into time. And so, ultimately, things like stories like Atlantis and Lemuria are, are really correct. You know, if Maybe we can turn the lights down and we would be able to see things a little bit better. But this is Turkey. Here's Gobekli Tepe. And in fact, uh, Gobekli Tepe is, is near the Syrian border. And it's actually where a lot of the, uh, the refugee camps and stuff are today. Near to Gobekli Tepe. Oh, and one thing I wanted to mention back here is that if you look at some of the things in Gobekli Tepe, you have these animals are carved on relief. And these are megaliths, these T-shaped megaliths. And in fact, at the Beckley Tepe, what they did was they purposely buried the site after it was built. So whoever built it purposely buried it. And actually German and uh, Turkish archaeologists are have been excavating in the last 10, 15 years. The largest megaliths in the world that we know of are at Baalbek in Lebanon, also near the Syrian border. And what you have there is a series of huge blocks of limestone. And they weigh up to a thousand tons or more. And, and so anything really weighing 20 tons or, or 50 tons is, is already a, a very, very heavy stone block to, make, to move. And when you're talking 100 tons or 200 tons, you're really talking about giant blocks. Obelisks, which are also monolithic uh, megaliths, an obelisk typically weighs around 500 tons. These blocks are weighing over 1,000 tons. And so some of them are just so huge. And, and part of it is why would anyone First of all, quarry such giant blocks and then move them. I mean, we wouldn't do it today. Now, mainstream archaeologists have to explain this. I mean, this is, this is absolutely real, these giant blocks. And in fact, what mainstream archaeology is saying is that the Romans actually built this temple at Balga. Although, really, in my mind, what's going on is there is a Roman temple there, but it's built on top of this earlier structure which is the, the terrace and these giant blocks. Well, here's how mainstream archaeologists explain it. They say that in order to move these giant blocks, and they're like the size of a semi-truck or a railway car. So they're building a huge 
cage around the block. And then what they do is they put little hourglass cuts into the block, and they have pulleys, and they have little blocks that then lock into the little wedge shape, and you have like a, you have a couple hundred of these on this cage here. You have to build this giant cage all around this huge block. And then, when it's all done, you're going to move it a few inches, and then start again. So why would anyone try to build like that? Why are you going to move such giant blocks, which would seem so difficult to us, but for them, it had to be easy, and that they had to have some kind of anti-gravity, some kind of levitation, and of course the mainstream is, is saying that, that, that of course they don't have it. And that's part of the problem that we'll see here. A similar thing is at the temple at Jerusalem, and you to see it, like these giant blocks here, this is also a huge block, it's like a thousand ton block of stone. And you see other ones down here, she's standing there, you see notches, you see some articulation, you see perfect fitting here. The temple at Jerusalem, which we call King Solomon's temple or something like that, it's a similar thing at Baalbek. In other words, the platform of that structure is also these gigantic blocks of stone. You can't really see it very well, or photograph it, because you have to go through a tunnel that the Israeli archaeologists have done, done uh, recently. So then, so anyway, the Jerusalem is also like Baalbek in that there's some earlier structure there that's gigantically huge. Now let's go to southern Egypt. This is actually uh, the Osirion, which is at Abydos in southern Egypt. And in fact, the Isra uh, Egyptian government spent years, decades even, pumping out this, these ruins. So down inside a swamp, there's a, a dynastic Egyptian temple right next to it. But what's at the Osirion is what they call pre-dynastic megalithic ruins. Uh, so we'll, we'll look here. See, this is all part of the Osirion. There's no hieroglyphs or anything or any kind of Egyptian writing at the Osirion. Gigantic blocks of uh, granite. Notice how that they're notched here, little notches, and you see also these knobs coming out. And these are curious. Archaeologists don't know what these what these knobs are doing, but these blocks are perfectly cut and perfectly fitted together, and that's similar to, of course, what we see also in South America. So let's now go to Cusco in Peru, and these are some of the blocks that you see in Cusco's jigsaw patterns of perfectly fitting granite blocks. They're cut, they're fitted together, and in fact, this is a, a, one of the most famous stones in Cusco. It's called the Stone of Twelve Angles, because there's twelve little corners here. So the articulation and the cutting and the fitting of this block, and in fact, uh, this stone here actually appears on the, the Cuscania beer that's, uh, that's brewed there in, in Cusco. So as you go walk through the streets of Cusco, you're actually walking through a megalithic city that still lived in today. And you see uh, these blocks of stone, again, it's pillow shape. These are, these, once again, those knobs that we saw, the, the cutting and notching in of these blocks. According to mainstream archaeologists, uh, this was all built by the Incas only a few hundred years before the Spanish got it. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, so much of mainstream archaeology, as, as, as far as I can tell, is just completely wrong. And it's, it's, it's one of the things that I write a lot about is, is you know, trying to criticize mainstream archaeology versus, say, us ancient astronauts and theorists. Now, we'll leave South America briefly and we'll go to Greece. This is actually a place called the Necromanticon, and it was only discovered in 1960. It's up in northwest Greece, near to Albania. And it has the same kind of jigsaw patterns and, and perfectly fitted blocks that are notched and cut in. So we have this jigsaw pattern of blocks that are locked. There's no mortar. And when the waves of an earthquake go through these areas, the, because the blocks are all locked in together in this jigsaw pattern, they, they move, but then they fall back into place. And it's, it's, it's really the most uh, secure form of building build with megalithic blocks and lock them in together with these with the jigsaw pads. On a hill just north of Cusco is a massive fortress called Sasewan. 
and it is a, it's also a, built with these jigsaw patterns. This is an aerial view. It has this, this kind of strange uh, kind of ribbed thing. There were towers that were up here in this area. This, this is sort of the top of a mountain right here. There were towers that have been dismantled. This area over here in front of these huge walls is a giant open field, like a, almost like an airport or something. And in fact, you could, and Machu Picchu has this too, where you could land, say, a big airship or something like that. Giant blocks of stone, they're, they're not as heavy as a ball bag or something, but they're still weighing 200 tons, something like that. They're perfectly fitted together. So why would even, the Spanish and the Incas even fought a battle at this place, but no one could really explain it. Like why, why this is built like this, what it, what it was even doing, they assumed it was some kind of fortress. Although, uh, it, it, it doesn't function very well with that. And once again, you have all of these huge, huge blocks that are just dragged up and fitted together. What you also have around Sexawana are blocks of stone like this that are like seemingly flipped over and, and on their, uh, they're upside down. And they have like upside down staircases and stuff like that carved in them. There's also a bunch of tunnels and things. Things like this, and they're actually quite well carved, but there's no reason for it. And uh, you can't, it makes no sense that even somebody would come and be cutting these blocks. It's like someone has a power tool or some kind of stone cutting device, and just because they have that tool, they go out and just start, you know, slicing and carving up blocks. Just, just playing and practicing. And in fact, that's what mainstream archaeologists are saying. They're saying, well, the Inca stone cutters went here to these upside down staircases and things like that to practice. <laughs> and, you know, it's, and that's part of the whole thing, which is not really explained by them, is why people are going through all this effort. What seems so difficult to us, we, we have big cranes, we have big boulders and stuff like that. We don't build with giant blocks like that today, even though we have, you know, the, the capability of it. We would build, just like this auditorium, it's built out of smaller blocks of stone, so blocks. There are parts there too where solid rock is just cut through. And there are tunnels and things like that. If you read my books on South America, uh, my book on ancient technology in Peru and Bolivia, I talk about a tunnel system that's under Cusco, that's going uh, uh, throughout the city, and supposedly there's this gold treasure that's there. And it has to do with 14 gold-clad Inca mummies that were kept in the Sun Temple, uh, and all this other you know, fantastic old treasure that's supposed to be underground there. Is, oh, no. So again, mainstream archaeologists, you know, they have to explain these things. Why are people doing this? And how? So the whole theory is, and, and it's a problem with, in South America, because the people supposedly did not know about the wheel. They didn't know about writing. They didn't have a, you know, a lot of the basic understandings that we have, yet they were doing things that we can't even do. But they had to do it in theory by brute force. And so they're, they're cutting, supposedly, these, these blocks with, with just stone hammers in their hand. Okay? And then they're going to build all these ramps and they're going to haul them up there. And then again, they have to fit perfectly. So in order to, they, in theory, they're raising and lowering these blocks and chipping away at it just a little bit because they can't have some little gap. They, they have to be fitted perfectly. It's, it's the kind of effort that's mind-boggling. And you, you see this in other places too, not just in, in South America. This is Machu Picchu. It's a secret city. It's a megalithic city. It's on top of a mountain. The, the Spanish never knew about Machu Picchu. It's, uh, today Machu Picchu is the number one tourist site in South America, and it's, it's a fantastically beautiful place. It's situated on top of a mountain, fantastic scenery, and then you have this amazing city right there. It's a megalithic city. So here we go, here's some of the blocks of Machu Picchu. Once again, notice these weird knobs. Archaeologists can't, don't know what they're for, or, or what function that they, they were part of these blocks. It's assumed in moving the blocks, but they don't all have them. This block too, this, this wall is very nicely made, it's pulling apart here, settling, things like that. Big lichen patches on these blocks, 
And this too is very, very well made wall and perfectly fitted together with the sink. Huge light in, again, the notching. This is really some amazing construction. Another site that to me is even more interesting than Machu Picchu is, is between Cusco and Machu Picchu, it's a site called Ayate Tambo. And Ayate Tambo is, is on the Urubamba River, uh, going down towards Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu is actually in a, in a jump, mountain jungle area, you know, towards the Amazon jungle. So at Oyante Tombo, here's what you've got. You've got uh, the site of itself is up here. It's, a, it's the archaeological site, it's a megalithic site. And it's on the edge of a, of a big cliff and a knife ridge. In fact, this is a very small, narrow little area here. We'll, we'll get up there in a minute. To get up there, you walk up to these terraces right here, and up this trail where these people are. And you walk up here, you keep walking up until you get up to this area here, and then you cross over into the main megalithic area, and we'll look at that now. As you're going up those steps, Stoyante Tombo, you, you, you see these fine walls, big lichen patches, again, perfectly fitted uh, blocks, the knobs, again, that are mysterious and not really explained. As you come up and you, you turn, you get this big wall on the side, big lichen patches, perfectly fitted. Can't even get a piece of paper or a razor blade between these blocks. And then, as you come up again, you, you see the perfect fitting here. And as you get up to the to the very top of what they call the Sun Temple, this is what you finally start seeing. You start seeing these giant blocks of red plant, granite that are lying there. And you see this one wall. Only this. This is like the only structure that's really still uh, complete. And it's not even complete. And it's a wall of seven huge granite blocks, again with knobs and things like that. And it, it's actually quite unusual because it has these very thin wedges of granite between the blocks. And also here's part of an Andean cross that's also been kind of chipped away. So when you get to the top of Mayante Tombo, this is kind of where everybody goes. You stand here, you look at this, you get some photos taken with your friends and stuff, and then you sort of walk around, and, and this is the main thing. But as you walk around to the side, you start seeing more weird stuff. You see blocks like this, you see things like this, you see a, a block like this, also big notch in here. This block is weighing 200, 300 uh, tons or something like that. So mainstream archaeologists are saying, well, the Incas built all this. The Incas just dragged these giant blocks up here, <laughs> and then they just filled it in with this crumb rubber like that. You know. I mean, it does, it makes sense. And so when you're looking at, at this, here's the Inca construction right here. You know, that's, this is what the Incas do. I mean, this is what, what you're seeing when you go here today. This is exactly how it looks today. This is exactly how it looked in Inca times, too. It hasn't changed at all. The Peruvian government can't do anything. They can't, they, they can't do anything with this. And so here, these huge blocks are just sitting here and lying around, and they're, and, and it doesn't make sense. So, here again, is you're going to have very sharp angles and corners. It's like somebody with a, a very fine router and saw is cutting through this. Now, this is what's particularly interesting here, is what are called keystone cuts. And it's, it's really proof that the Incas didn't build this, and that all of these structures are pre-Inca. And in fact, whoever really built Tiwanaku and Kumakunku, uh, they're the also ones who built this. And they like built Machu Picchu and all these places. And part of the proof is this, and it's what are called keystone cuts. So you have a, you have a giant block that's weighing a Tons or whatever, and then you cut this, and this is hard, very hard granite too. You're going to cut this T-shaped uh, cut here, but there has to be another one on the other one. So there's always two of these, and then molten metals are poured into there, and it creates what's called uh, a clamp or a cram. So it's an unusual way, really, of fixing two giant blocks together. And you wouldn't think these huge blocks of stone are going anywhere, anyway. But they were doing this. And so, and that's an unusual thing. We know that that's not really something that the Incas did. Now in fact, and we're going to be seeing some more of this, 
If you go around to the side of that, that one wall we were looking at, here's another block of granite, and it's got a keystone cut, cut into it, but it's on a vertical wall. And then it can't be here. I mean, this, this is a block of stone that's in the wrong place. It, it can't be on a vertical wall. A keystone cut like this in the clamp has to be on a horizontal surface because molten metals are poured into it. We'll see more of that as we go along. You go up to the giant um, the megalithic quarry. It's actually on the other side of the river. Here's the Uruamba River here. The Oyate Tambo, it's over here on this uh, knife edge. So the blocks of stone, the giant blocks, had to come down this mountain, cross this river, which they can't figure out how they did that, and then has to go up this knife red ridge and then be uh, fixed into what is, would be the giant temple. So the quarry itself, it takes like a day to get up here to ride horses and stuff, but it's a huge granite uh, cliff, really, with all these blocks of stone that are sitting there. And then what you have is you have stones that are mid quarry. And they're like this, uh, like the size of a semi truck or something. And they're sitting up there at 40. They've been squared. And in fact, you can even see where huge saws were cutting these the blocks of stone, just like slicing bread. And in fact, it would have to be a kind of like what they call a wire saw. And this would require like a cable and, and diamond dust some kind of diamond gravel and, and sand in there to, to, to facilitate the cutting. I mean, much of the way a modern quarry works today would have to be how they would cut these stones too. And in fact, at the quarry is this giant stone wheel. And it's perfectly smooth too, as, as, as it's been cut. I mean, some huge saw is just slicing these things. And, and in fact, what's strange is that the Incas, well, they didn't even know the wheel. But this is like some Fred Flintstone wheel. <laughs> so back in Cusco, there is this, a structure there that's called the, the Sun Temple or the Cori Concha. And that Cori Concha was at one point wallpapered with gold. And it too, was a, it, because these structures are so well made, they're, they're still standing after thousands of years. It's, it's very similar. If you go to Egypt and walk around Egypt, you're walking around through buildings that are 3,000, 4,000 years old, and they're still standing there. And they're better than any buildings that you will see in Egypt today. And you, you have a similar thing in, in Peru, where in downtown Peru, you've got shops and hospitals and, and, and sh uh, restaurants and hotels, and they're in these ancient buildings, but those people didn't build those buildings, they're already standing there. At, in the Sun Temple of the Kori Concha, what they've got is, also, this, this <clears throat> alcove, in a sense, and they've, it's, it's so important, and it, there was an earthquake in 1950 that, that destroyed some of it because it's a Spanish monastery, and it destroyed some of the walls, and they suddenly found things like this that they hadn't seen before. But this, this is all very finely articulated and cut, and with all of these, these little grooves and things like that, it's like some kind of cables were run through this. And that even some kind of machine or device with electrical cables and stuff like that was coming into it. Uh, and it was like some like a television or something like that. And just with all of this, the, sorry about that, uh, all of these little um, spots for cables and stuff like that, and it's all very, very heavily articulated. I mean, when you see it, you're just baffled. You, you don't know, you know what, what would they even, why would they have done all this, and what was it for? Mainstream archaeologists are saying, oh, well, you know, they just had a tapestry or something like that, you know, kind of tied on up in here. So, so, I mean, we don't know what was there. We just don't know. But it was like something pretty complicated must have been sitting there. So we'll, we'll go now uh, to higher up in the Andes to Lake Titicanca. And this is a place called Katimbo. And it's on top of a, a mesa up here. You have to... There's a parking lot over here, you have to walk up these trails, and you walk up here, you get up on top of this mesa, and then there are these strange structures up there. On the way up to Mesa, there's a weird little spot there too, where it's like somebody again has taken a power tool and taken part of the cliff, and for some unknown reason, just playing around here, you can't figure out why, and they just like cut right along this, this edge, and then they polished this whole bottom part. 
And you're looking at it, and you're like, well, you know, again, why would you even do this? And, but you would have had to have some kind of like a power tool to do it. When you get up to the top of Katimbo, you have these unusual structures, like towers, and then there's this strange uh, square structure. It's also quite well made and perfectly fitted together, pillowy shaped um, stones. And then what you have again, you have things like serpents are in relief and pumas on some of the stones. So here's some uh, mountain lions in here, also some pumas. And actually to fashion cut stones and things like this and then leave an animal in relief like that, it's very difficult. You have to actually be planning all that. Again, it's, it's stone cutters who have power tools and stuff are just are getting fancy and doing things. Now, there are certain stones in Cusco that also have these serpents are just, just randomly, you know, it's a good stone and it'll have a serpent on it. And it, there's a number of places around Cusco and different places in Peru. Well, the oldest religion in the world, supposedly, is the Yazidis of northern Iraq. And some of these people have been recently kidnapped by ISIS and stuff like that. And they still have temples. Uh, these are the Kurds, really, in the very, very farther north of Iraq. And what is on their ancient temples is this serpent. This, this same kind of serpent that you see carved in these rocks in, in Peru. And that was also what was at Gobekli Tepe, too, where these animals and oftentimes serpents are on these, these buildings. These people, too, these Yazidis, are essentially the, uh, the inheritors of the Sumerians. And their religion is essentially an ancient Sumerian religion which survives today. So, not far from here, as you go along the, the, the road, which is in Peru on the west side of Lake Titicaca, you'll suddenly see this thing, which is the the so-called uh, Devil's Door, or the Door of Amaru Moon. It's this door that's carved, it's just carved into a solid rock face. This is a kind of strange ridge coming down. You can actually see it from the road, but uh, for long time tourists just largely ignored it. But about 15 years ago, tourists started going here. This thing is about 20 feet high. This is about 6 feet high, like a person could stand in here. Uh, the whole thing's been cut, and it's, it's quite old. There's these little grooves. This thing's about 20 feet high. But once again, you're, when you look at this, it's, you have no idea why would anybody do this. Why is there this door? It's just out in the middle of nowhere. There's no other structure that's there. People claim that it's like some kind of stargate, or that you, know, you can meditate here. People are doing that more and more. Spend the night here and do things, and they, they you know, have interesting experiences. Yeah. Well, false doors like this are also known in Egypt. And in fact, this is one that's in Giza. And so this is, uh, in the Giza Plateau, if you walk around, suddenly here it is. Just a door carved into solid rock, going nowhere. Uh, in Egyptology, it's known as a false door. So I mean, exactly why these doors are there, uh, and whether they are some kind of interdimensional portal or, or some kind of gateway that's, that's going somewhere. Well, we just don't know. I've been to that door a number of times, and it's always interesting. But I can't tell you I've had any strange experiences. This is, this is Lake Titicaca. And Lake Titicaca is the highest navigable lake uh, in the world. It has to be steamships and stuff like that. Even the Bolivian Navy is supposed to have a submarine or something here. There's a lot of UFO activity at Lake Titicaca. There's underwater ruins there. Jacques Cousteau at one point did some diving. And so, uh, there's some very strange things about Lake Titicaca. There are seahorses in Lake Titicaca. And biologists have not been able to explain that very well. Seahorses normally live in, in tropical areas like Indonesia and in, on coral reefs and things like that. Lake Titicaca is nearly 13,000 feet in the Andes, but it has seahorses in it. They, they have trouble explaining. James Churchward, who was a, a, a 
British colonel in India in the late 1800s. He then actually moved to the United States after traveling throughout the Pacific. And in 1924, he wrote this famous book called The Lost Continent of Mu. And he claimed that uh, these, these Indian rishis, the, this priest, had showed him a secret library and had told him about the lost continent of Mu and sent him on this search to find Mu. And uh, church where had a lot of money and so we traveled all over the world at the time. So he actually created this uh, map of South America which shows the Amazon basin here, that the Amazon basin was a sea at that time. The whole South American continent was down and that, uh, that, that there was actually a canal, like an ancient Panama Canal connecting the Pacific to the Amazon Sea, like Chittacago and part of that. This is his explanation for how seahorses would have been there. Had land, you know, had land, so this is over here or something. So, just near to the, the southern shore of Lake Titicaca is Tiwanaku. And this is the famous sun gate at Tiwanaku. And this gate, so we'll start looking at Puma Puku, it's, it's nearby. This gate it is a solid uh, piece of uh, andesite, of, of, of granite. And in fact, it's been split. Look over here, this is all part of some other big building, which is gone now. And in fact, as you come down here, suddenly there's this notch, and then the, the wall continues over here, so some other giant building was fitted in there. This is what's also called a monolithic doorway. In other words, it's a doorway, but it's carved out of one solid piece of rock. Let's we'll see some more of those. This guy here is kind of the most famous, this is the most famous thing at Tiwanaku. He supposedly is the son of Viracocha, He's wearing a big Indian headdress of feathers, just you know, the way we think of Indian chiefs having big feathered headdresses and stuff. And it's hard to see right here, he's holding staffs on either side of him. And he's got tears are coming down his cheeks. And they say that these are the tears of the sun. And, that, and in fact, the tears, are, and the tears of the sun are his gold. So in some ways, what, what you're getting from this guy is that this Tiwanaku is a place of liquid gold, of liquid metals. And we'll see more of that. And in fact, there had to be all that. When they started doing excavations in the 1920s in, in Tiwanaku, they dug up gigantic, with huge statues and put them on display. Uh, and like this guy here, they were wearing turbans. They have on uh, kind of weird fish hands with fish scales. They're holding unusual things in their, in, uh, their hands. Um, they have goggle-headed uh, eyes and stuff. These guys look pretty strange. Something else that's there at Tiwanaku is, is like this. And in fact, I, will, I was forbidden to take a photo of this, but I did at the time. <laughs> and, and it was this. This is this entrance into, into, this, into a, a, a cavern there and, and a tunnel system. So what was there at Tiwanaku, as they're just discovering, and they only found this out about 10 years ago or so, was there was this slight uh, tunnel system. And, and uh, I mean, this is a very small, this is not some giant door, it's, it's pretty small. Uh, but, and they don't know where it leads, so it went back inside this pyramid. And uh, so, I mean, this is, the, the more excavations they do there, the, the stranger things they find. This is also a famous statue that's at Tiwanaku uh, in the, what's it called, the Sunken Temple. And this is the famous Kontiki statue that the Norwegian archaeologist Norah Pyro made famous. And he's called Kontiki uh, there, and, uh, and if you notice he has a beard, he has a big mustache, he's got these goggle-headed eyes, he's got a beard and mustache, and then his hands are in what's called the Tiki position. The tiki position is, is your right hand over your stomach, or, or sorry, your left hand over your stomach, and your right hand over your heart, just the way he's got it there. That's, that's called the tiki position. And if you go to, to Tahiti or New Zealand, uh, Polynesian islands where you get tiki medallions and stuff, they're always, that's always how they have their have the hands uh, like that. So that's, that's a tiki. So this would, this would make uh, certainly strong connections to Easter Island and, and other Pacific Islands. And it, what's also important to point out uh, is that American Indians really don't grow uh, 
heavy beards and mustaches and things. They don't usually have a shave. So this is a guy who's he's like some uh, Mediterranean guy or something like that. What's also there at Tiwanaku is this, the Akafama Pyramid. And it was a pyramid, and in fact that those tunnels entrances I was showing you were kind of over here. At the very top of the pyramid was an artificial lake. There was an Andean cross. And in fact, what they had to do was they had to force water uphill to this lake. And it was a reservoir that they used, apparently, for washing ores and things. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Okay, so here's where Leite Naga is here, La Paz, uh, Lima is over here, the Nazca, we'll see that in a little bit, it's right over in this area. This is a satellite photo of Lake Titicaca. So Tiwanaku is, is down in this area. This is, uh, they divide Lake Titicaca into a greater lake and a, a smaller lake, which is down here in the, in the south. It's this area down here where they say there are sunken cities and underwater things. This is the area of the lake that's very, very deep over here. And this is the Bolivian side here. Uh, a lot of UFOs are, are seen coming up out of the lake. Uh, and they do sky watches and stuff like that. So this is the smaller lake area. This is also an area that they say has a lot of UFO activity. It's on the southern part. And this is a shallower area. And allegedly, I'm told there's some kind of sunken city that's over in this area. And then Tiwanaku itself is, is kind of over there. About half of Lake Tiwanaku is in Bolivia, the other half is in Lake Titicaca too is a place where you have these uh, the, the reed boats that are unsinkable. And those same reed boats were were used in, in Egypt and Iraq, also in Toronto and East Island, and then of course also in South America. Ramiro Gonzalez was a Bolivian artist uh, who did a book on on Tiwanaku that I, I liked it. And like Church, where he saw Tiwanaku and Pumukumu as a as a canal city. Uh, he thought that it, he, he saw water everywhere. You would go through Tiwanaku on, on boats, say, and there would be pyramids and stuff rising, and canals around it. He also saw South America uh, as a kind of a, a long, thin Andean, like, like New Zealand or something, Norway with fjords, uh, and like and a pole shift. The whole idea that the, the Earth, that church were thought this too, that the earth occasionally flips around and, and that what's, what, what's at the North Pole actually moves. And so that the poles are shifting a lot. When there are pole shifts, according to them, there are you know, devastating cataclysms, earthquakes, volcanoes are going off, uh, continents rise and fall, and you would have things like Atlantis or something is, is destroyed, as it were. And, and, and they think that South America very much has been to these kind of categories. All right, this is, this is Pumukuku. And Pumukuku is about, uh, it's, it's only uh, about half a mile or so from the main Tiwanaku area. When you, when you go to Tiwanaku, or you go to Pumukuku, it's giant blocks of sandstone and granite just lying around. And once again, we have these keystone cuts that we were talking about. And in fact, these are huge, these ones here. So you have these cuts, T-shaped ones, there's another one here. These are giant slabs of, of sandstone. And then molten metals are poured into this. We'll, we'll see that. It's an unusual way of fitting blocks. So here's the H blocks right here, and some of these big slabs. What was at Pumapuku was some huge building, which was destroyed. Uh, we are here. This is a granite slab here. And uh, so um, here's some of the ace blocks, and in fact, we're, we're here doing the Ancient Aliens show at this point. Some of the blocks here, too, are they're so incredibly well articulated. So somebody, and, and this is part of the, the problem here, again, with the mainstream, is that somebody with power tools, they're, they're articulating and cutting all of these corners and inside corners. And Supposedly, they don't have iron tools, they don't have power tools. They're doing it literally, supposedly, with like a stone hammer in their hand. Uh, and, I mean, they're doing things that are almost just impossible. I just said, yeah, oh, okay, I wonder what it is. Yeah, it's kind of hard to fit it. 
Some people don't forget. Okay. All right, let's do that. Yeah, it does seem kind of washed out. All right, so, uh, let me see. All right, here, I guess I'll stop right here. So here we are doing the ancient and thing. All right, they want to take a break right now, and that's, that's a good time. We're, we're just about out of the way, too, or yeah, something. You gotta All right, so we'll take a break, like a 10 minute break or something. <laughs> Right here, 
This is very difficult. And again, to bash this out with a stone hammer in your hand or something, you can't do it. This is, again, something that just it has to be done with power tools. This is also one of the monolithic doors that's standing here. You can see sockets and things like that at the bottom, or what it would have been stood up. This is it's been split. So here we go. These are the back sides of some of the uh, H blocks. But now what's interesting is that some of these monolithic doors are really are in other parts of the world too, including Persepolis. And this is Persepolis in Iran. And in fact, these monolithic doorways there in Iran are, are almost identical to what is at Tiwanaku. And they are, and what's unusual again here, I mean, this is one piece of granite. And you have this articulated door jams, just like you see at Tiwanaku. This is the kind, this is a diagram of what these monolithic doors would be like in articulation. I mean, designing, cutting these things, and building the whole thing, it's all incredibly complicated and, and, and pre-planned. These are some of the clamps. This is, the, this is in the museum there. So this would have been some alloy. Uh, could have had gold and silver in it, uh, and probably uh, some type of bronze. And in fact, keystone cuts like this are in other parts of the world. These are in Egypt, OK? And here's keystone cut here, and this is a, like an axe that keeps those cut. These are at Karnak, uh, Luxor in Egypt. Here's a wall too. This is at Edfu in southern Egypt. But this is, a, again, a wall of, of, of reused blocks of stone. So all of these keystone cuts here and cuts, they're not to be here. I mean, they wouldn't be on a vertical wall like this. Somebody has dismantled another structure. The ancient Egyptians did this, and then they put this wall together. And in fact, you know, you'll, you'll have a, you'll have a uh, keystone cut here, but you know, it's not on that side. Here they've actually put a couple together, just happened to be those stones together. But they would have had to have been on a, on a flat horizontal surface, not like this. But those are keystone cuts. And in fact, if you go to a place in central Vietnam, this is called Mi Son, which is near Da Nang, Again, you have these same keystone cuts, just like at Tiwanaku, cut into basalt and into uh, granite. And in fact, I mean, this is an unusual way of cutting blocks and then fitting the keystone cuts, but, and you know, people wouldn't just independently create this in other parts of the world. And when I was in Vietnam and I was showing this to the guides, and in fact, this keystone cut, this is in basalt, and I showed these to the guides there, and they had never noticed them before. And I had to explain to them what they were. I said, yeah, that's a, that is a keystone cut. And there has to be another one, and all these the metal clamps are poured into it, all this kind of stuff. And he was, you know, he was like, wow, you know, that's interesting. Thanks for telling me. I mean, I mean I, I, this was my guide at the site. <laughs> so look, if you look here, too, look at this articulation here. This is, this is basalt. This is a super, duper hard stone. But they've not just cut it and, and then notched and all this, but they have these very subtle little cuts and, and lines here. Again, this is this would have to be done with power tools. So this is what Maison looks like. It's a megalithic site. And in fact, during the Vietnam War, parts of the city were, were bombed. Because uh, it was right on the really the border of North and, and South Vietnam. In fact, here's the main Maison is over here. These people who did this, they were called the camp. And this was their capital, was this island off of Vietnam. And in fact, that's where we get uh, the, the word today, Cambodia, and Cambodia, the camp. And in fact, here's a strange thing about the camp. Ancient Egypt, the Egyptians themselves called themselves camp. The ancient word for Egypt is Kamet, or Kamet. So wherever you have the word camp, you're, you're sort of, you're looking at a, a word of, uh, ancient Egyptian word for Egypt. And when you're at Misson and the museum in Da Nang, and it's a kind of Hindu Buddhist, uh, it's pretty interesting. That's Shiva. Here's a Shiva guy too. Big long earlobes, uh, which is a Buddhist Hindu thing. Buddha's always depicted as having these very, very long earlobes. But look at this guy too. Very wide uh, nose and thick lips and his hair. Uh, a lot of these guys look uh, kind of African in fact. Here's Shiva in the Ocho. Notice the third eye and his forehead. These are all from Vietnam and the camp people. 
this guy too is a cam statue. And in fact, it looks very modern. If you were to take a photo of this and take it to Mexico and show people, they would say, oh yeah, that's some Mayan statue or something, isn't it? No, it's from Vietnam. Here's a cam guy too. He's actually some kind of Hindu sadhu. He's got the, the, the beard and the mustache. He looks a lot like Kantiki. Here's a woman, probably a Sita, consort of, of Shiva. And in fact, if you go to Angkor Wat in Cambodia, you'll see also the same thing. And when I was there in 99, the Japanese archaeologists were so excited that they had found the keystone cuts and the clams there in Angkor Wat. And in fact, you also have these unusual doors in Angkor Wat too. Um, and the whole megalith building throughout the Pacific, this is actually in Sumatra. These guys, this is about 1910 or so, and they're moving some giant megalith that was probably somewhere else, and they were, they're moving it to some other place in the village. But it shows you how, yeah, I mean, people can just drag giant stones around if they want to. It's all possible. In, also in Indonesia, this is a place called Bata Valley, the central part of, of Sulawesi. And this is a very remote area. Uh, here's Bata Valley in the middle of Sulawesi, and they think that this is where rice cultivation originated. There's only been a road to this place for the last 10 years. This is what Bada Valley lives like, looks like. It's high up in the mountains of Sulawesi. And then there's all these weird statues there. They look kind of like Easter Island statues. They're very large, sweeping um, noses and things like that. These statues are just out in people's yards and things like that. This is one of the bigger ones. Uh, here's our guides and stuff. But if you look at also the the way that the eyes and everything are here, very, very well made. It's also, again, some kind of power tool has been used that to make these circles, to make these big sweeping arcs and things like that. The people who live there have no idea who made these statues, why they're there. It's a gold mining area. Also, what you have in around Bada Valley, just out in the fields, are these granite jars. They're, they're just made out of, they're like a granite boulder, but somebody has cut the whole thing into, a, into like a barrel, and then they cut out the center of the tube. Uh, and here you can see this is a broken one, but very finely made. And even they were, they're taking these granite boulders and making very thin uh, jars out of it. And they have no idea why and why they would do this. How? It would seem so difficult to make these things. And there's a place in Laos called the Plain of Jars. It's also all of these jars like that, uh, just sitting out there in a, in a plane. And then no one knows, they don't know who made it, why, what these jars are for, but it's some big effort that someone's made thousands and thousands of years ago, and it, it baffles archaeologists. At a place in northern Cambodia, we call Priya, Priya Vigir, is this place with the three windows, and it's a lot like Machu Picchu. And in fact, the, the Cambodians and the Thai government fought over this mountain for a long time. Thailand kept saying this is in Thailand. Cambodia kept saying no, this is in Cambodia. But here, also has the monolithic doors. Lots of, uh, it's a megalithic city, very well built. And it's got the keystone cuts. The same thing. Here we are, exactly the same kind of T-shaped keystone, keystone cuts that we we see at Pumapunku, that we see at Oyate Tongo, at Tiwanaku, also in Vietnam, we see it also in Egypt, more of the Keystone Cups. So, let's go back to Pumapunku again. Archaeologists had, uh, had tried to design, uh, imagine what this building would have looked like. Uh, this is some of the um, uh, articulation again of some of these blocks. Oops. Uh, just the articulation of these blocks and all the different cutting and notching. And, I mean, engineers were amazed and baffled by this. I mean, it's not something that just primitive people would be doing. Uh, with ba again, bashing things out with stuff hammers and stuff like that. Here's a diagram of one of the age blocks. Here's how the age blocks would maybe would be fitted together. And this is a video, let's see, it's supposed to go, let's see. How do I make the movie go jump? This is the one thing we should have tested it. Uh, 
shows you how the age blocks, and you've probably seen this on HA lens anyway, how they, they come down and they, they fit together. And in fact, I was just in Australia with, with Eric Bodonikin uh, for a month in, in July. And he's a great guy, by the way. Uh, he's a fun guy, he's an interesting guy. It's interesting to be with him. And Giorgio's a fun guy, too. All right, so when you... <laughs> and actually, now that I've been on the show, uh, now... And, you know, this didn't used to happen to me, but now the last few years it happens. I pick up at the airport or something, and people will recognize me and they'll come up to me. And they'll say to me, you're, that, you're one of those guys on that ancient show, aren't you? And I'll say, yeah, yeah, probably. And then the next thing they always say to me is, what's with that guy's hair? <laughs> But you're not supposed to take photos of it. 
<laughs> I don't know why they tell you, you know. Don't take photos of you, just, you know, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this also has Sumerian writing. And in fact, there's two types of Sumerian writing. There's cuneiform, which you see here, and then you have uh, 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 a hieroglyphic uh, writing. So there's two types of Sumerian writing on the point of Bible. Here we go, that's the hieroglyphic writing, it's Sumerian, and that is the cuneiform writing. This is the guy who discovered it, Maximiliano. Maximiliano dug it up, he lived near Tijuana in a little hut. He, digging his garden or something, he found a ceramic bowl, he used it to feed his pigs. <laughs> and get this, it, that, this was in 1960 that he discovered this bowl. And what, what then a local priest noticed he had it there, and Bolivian archaeologists got involved, and what they did was they, they traded him a house for this for his bowl. Uh, Okay, so they traded him a house for this, and you know, that's kind of a mud shack, probably, really, but uh, that's what he got. And so, here's the whole thing now, and then this is Sumerian. This thing cannot really be there. This is, in a sense, an upart, an out-of-place artifact. To mainstream archaeologists, this is a time bomb. This is, this is a mine. This cannot be there. For mainstream art, this totally destroys all of mainstream archaeology in, in, in South America. That, that a bowl, that, I mean, this bowl would be from 2000 to 3000 BC. Okay, and that's the type of writing here. And a bowl from Samaria cannot be discovered at That I mean, that, in, in archaeology, that just can't be. But, it, but it's happened. And this bowl is in the National Museum. In La Paz. You, I mean, National Geographic, no mainstream archaeologist would ever go there and, and validate this. You, it would never be on a National Geographic uh, show, it, it, because it, they couldn't discuss it. It, it can't be there. It, it disproves everything they're talking about. And in fact, I, I am convinced that if this bowl had been found in Peru, it wouldn't be amazing. And the mainstream archaeologists, they would, they would suppress us. But look, Bolivia is kind of a rogue country, which is a good thing. I mean, Bolivia is just one of those countries where, look, don't tell us what to do. Don't tell us what to put in our museums. You know, we, we do things the Bolivian way, you know. And that's good. So anyway, this, yeah, this thing is very, very important. And, and as far as I'm aware, it's only been on one television show ever, and that's Ancient Aliens. And, and Ancient Aliens is the only show that would show something like this. So let's, all right, let's keep going. This is actually uh, from a museum in, 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 in Tijuana. So this is what the, the Aymara Indians look, look like, really, around there. This is very typical of how they look. Uh, he's wearing a turban, by the way. But other ceramics there are different, like look at this guy. He looks very oriental. He looks like he could really be from China or something. Or this guy in the back. He's, uh, again, got a big, thick uh, mustache and beard. He does not look like the local uh, natives. Now, also, they're at the museum. And they, by the way, they're taking this off display now. You cannot see this. And you were never supposed to photograph it anyway. But these are these <laughs> unusual you know, skulls and skeletons. Stuff. So, so we're going to now start looking at some of the unusual and this was a display there for a while. Most of the good skulls, actually, and unusual ones, come from the coastal area of Peru. This is Ica, this is an area called Paracas. Uh, Lima is up here. Nazca, the famous line of Nazca, are, are, are down in here. So now we're going to the coastal desert. So these are some of the uh, skeletons and things like that that you might see there. And, and they're at Ica. So when you go to when you go to Ica and Paracas, you really start to see some pretty unusual uh, skeletal skeletons and skulls. I mean, some of these guys have elongated craniums that are easily twice a normal human size. I don't like this. I mean, they're 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 pretty shocking when you see them, and there's a lot of them there. Um, 
So there's a number of official museums uh, in Peru that they put them on display. This is the Chongos Pyramid, where a lot of the uh, a lot of the unusual skeletal material and skulls and stuff like that have been found. Guys like this. Um, there's a whole necropolis. It's a very, very dry area of, of Peru. It's, it's, it's hardly rains there at all. That's what preserves these skeletons and, and skulls. Now this is a very, this is probably the most unusual of all of the skulls that have been found there. And what's, what's strange about it really is when you have, when you, there is a way of binding heads and, and shaping of a baby skull. It has to be very young. I mean, just a newborn infant, literally. <clears throat> and through binding, we'll see that in a minute. minute. You can force the head and the cranium and, and, and force it to grow to become a, a cone head. Kind of thing. In fact, I just saw that one of those insurance companies has the column heads now. Or, yeah. So anyway, you have plates in your head. And so as, as you get older, the plates in your head then start to fuse and grow together. And then there's like kind of sutures and stuff at the very top of your head. But this guy does not have that. So he is, he's an unusual thing in that he, he the way his skull has fused, there's not the sutures at the top, there's only this thing here. So he, this is not a, a normal human skull, in a sense. I mean, in, in any way. So, as far as a skull being really possibly an extraterrestrial, this is probably about the closest one that we can find. I mean, it just doesn't seem to show what we call normal human so the whole idea there is that our, we know that some of these people are just artificially formed, and that's a whole other story itself. But are some people actually born with these elongated skulls? And that's the big question. Some of the skulls too, by the way, through there, they have a, a red hair and stuff like that. This is also in that same area that's called the candlestick of the Andes. Uh, it kind of points towards Tiwanaku and, and Nazca. It's just a little bit farther south, but you have the Nazca Plain and all the Nazca lines. Uh, they can really only be seen from the air. And it's a popular tourist site today. You know, there's, there's a small airport there, and basically when you're in Nazca, you get into a plane and you, you go flying, you just go flying over these uh, all the lines and things like that. And it's fascinating. And you always know, have to wonder, you know, just what it's all about. And it's confusing. I don't think anybody's totally really figured it out. It's, there's just so much stuff going there. But it does really seem that it has to be seen from the air to make any sense, that's for sure. So look, these elongated skulls, they're in Mexico too, they're in the United States or all over the world, the Olmecs did it. And in fact, the Olmecs themselves are an unusual bunch. The Olmecs were down in uh, southern Mexico and in the Gulf of Mexico. And some of their ceramics, this is what the Olmecs, this is how they portrayed themselves with these big eyes and stuff like that. This is apparently what, what they look like. This is an unusual skull. This is what they call a pumpkin head. He, rather than having an elongated cone head skull, his skull has been smashed in and, and wide. This is actually on display at the museum at Merida in the upper town. So we know that there are ways to deform children's skulls. And you can't shape them and do that. And there's, there's no question that ancient people did it. But it's why. Why would they do that? What were they trying to do? They were, and it was this high class. There was some kind of group of people who had these elongated skulls. And they were, say, the Anunnaki. Uh, they, they, they weren't uh, small little gray aliens or something. These guys are, are six, seven, eight feet tall. And then have a big, long uh, cranial you know, uh, heads and stuff like that. Up until 1940, the Olmecs, as a civilization, didn't really exist. Archaeologists didn't know anything about them. They thought the Mayans were the oldest uh, culture in, in Mexico. And then in 1940, they brought archaeologists from all over the world to Mexico City to this big conference where Mexican archaeologists laid out the story of the Olmecs. They said, yeah, there's a whole other culture here in Mexico that we, we, that's older than everybody, and they're called the Olmecs, and blah, blah, blah. And so now we have the story of the Olmecs. But the more you know about the Olmecs, it's the weirder it gets. These guys, are, they, they make these what they call colossal heads. They're also in Guatemala. These giant heads and boulders and 
statues, they, they dig them up in farms and bulldozers. It's uh, during some of the oil exploration along the Gulf Coast of Mexico, because a lot of the Olmec area is the oil area of, of Mexico too. And literally just find these giant heads in swamps and things like this. Um, lying there. So, so this, is a, this is a famous one. It's now in a museum in Jalapa. This is basalt. Very, very well made. And again, it would have to be power tools that would, could do this uh, as, you see, as you look at these. And, it's, it's, and this is basalt too. Extremely, extremely hard stuff. So they're digging them up just in these jungle swamps and stuff like that. And actually at La Benta, the, the cities they had there with pyramids and stuff were very well made. They had pre-planned uh, plumbing and uh, water systems and stuff like that. And in fact, the whole, the main Olmec area is what's called the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. It's this narrow area of, of Mexico. In fact, this is the Panama Canal of Mexico. And the Olmecs were on the Pacific side and on the Atlantic side. And the Olmecs were also down in Honduras and stuff too. Look at this guy here. He's an Olmec statue in Alapa. He's apparently wearing kind of an Egyptian type headdress. And he's got a false beard on, like Egyptians would wear. Very Egyptian. Here's an Olmec guy. He's holding the, the ball, the rubber ball. It was the Olmecs who invented really the, the ball game. And in fact, these ball courts are up in northern Arizona and southern Utah. And they brought their rubber balls up there too. And this is a really interesting uh, colossal head of one of the Olmecs. Because, and archaeologists noticed this, and they couldn't figure it out. But this is, a, this is one of the colossal heads. But somebody has taken a power tool and defaced it. And they and all these little dish marks right here. And archaeologists noticed it. They, they couldn't explain it. And somebody with like some power grinder or something, just because they had a power tool in their hand, they decided they didn't like this guy. <laughs> and they came up, they just started dishing like bits out of the out of the, the statue and defacing it. Um, yeah, that, I mean that's 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 what's going on here. And archaeologists noticed that, but they couldn't figure out how anybody could like, make these dish marks uh, and, and what they would do. Also in the old Mac Park, which in Via Hermosa, the, the back of one of the statues is the same thing. If somebody's taken some power tool, like a big drill or something, and just start drilling into it. And, and you know, they're just playing with their power tool. They're doing stuff because they can. This is an unusual place too. This is a place also in Mexico called Comacalco. Comacalco was an old Mac city, later it became a Mayan city, it was a port city on the Atlantic. And at Comacalco, they had this display. And by the way, they've removed this from the display now. I, last time I was there, a couple of years ago, they had completely taken this off. Because some archaeologists came in and said, get, get that off the display. Because it's pretty unusual. Look at some of these guys here. Very uh, oriental. And here's some weird looking guys. This guy over here, all these guys. This one here, Chinese. I mean, these are, these are all ceramics and statues that they found at Comalco, Comacalco. But they're all so strange. Yeah, in the end, the Mexican archaeologists thought, well, this is a cool display. But then at some point, yeah, somebody said, no, no, this, this is too weird. You know, some ancient alien guys would come along and think it's uh, important. This is more Olmec stuff. These are these jade uh, kelps. These were found. In a, and this is, all again, what these guys look like. If I don't, they're going to have these elongated heads, almost sort of oriental eyes and stuff like that. And in fact, there's Shang Dynasty writing on the backs of these, these are called Celts, these things. So look, even in ancient Egypt, people also had these, they had elongated heads and stuff too. Akhenaten and Nefertiti. Uh, this is Meritaten, who was one of the daughters of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. She has an elongated head. And in fact, uh, Tutankhamun too, he's a cone head as well. And you never really read about that. A lot of Egyptologists early on thought that, oh, these guys only look like this because they're because of incest and you know, poor diet and stuff like that. So they have these strange heads. No, it, this is a purposely done. Um, this is a statue, this is a statue of Tutankhamun from his own tomb. And you, and even all you you see stuff about Tutankhamun all the time, but they never talk about him having, you know, a deformed head or something like that. And these are your Anunnaki guys. These are your Ubaid figures. They come from about four, they're from 
Rome about 4000 BC. They're mainly they're named after a uh, a city in, in Iraq, a Sumerian city called Ubay. They have the elongated heads, and with archaeologists, they, what they call this is coffee bean eyes. <coughs> so you have these eyes, these unusual eyes, goggle eyes, coffee bean eyes, and then the elongated uh, uh, features. But even in ancient China and Korea, they had also these elongated heads. This is some kind of Taoist, immortal guy. Um, <laughs> Here are these all their Chinese guys, Taoists, the mortals. <clears throat> They're pumpkin heads, those guys. So, so you have this whole thing. I mean, and, and this is all very strange. The whole, why well, would people <clears throat> do this deformation? Did some people just naturally look like this? I mean, they're terrestrials, of course. This is, this is how they looked, and then the royalty wanted to imitate them. This is a Chinook Indian uh, from Seattle. So around Seattle, they were doing it too. I went to high school in Missoula, Montana. North of Missoula is the largest freshwater lake in uh, western Mississippi, which is called Flathead Lake. Well, it's called Flathead Lake because the Flathead Indians live there. And they were called the Flathead Indians because they had flat heads. They were called heads too. So yeah, these Indians of the Pacific Northwest, they were doing it as well. And in fact, people today in Vanuatu and also in northern Iraq, and in, this is in the Congo. So this is from about 1920. Uh, this is a Dutch um, anthropologist. This kid's going to be a conhead. His head is bound. This is his cranium. And it's all bound. Here we go. Here's what a little baby looks like when their head has been deformed. So we know for a fact, I mean, a, a normal human child can you know, have their head manipulated to be some weird conhead. But the part we don't get is, again, why do people do this all over the world? And, and mainstream archaeologists are saying, oh, it's, uh, it's, you know, these are just independent people. All, and all these continents are doing this separately. Like the Keystone Cuts. Yeah, they just separately made it up in each one of these places. Which is, you know, ridiculous. Obviously, you know, they're right. So I was doing a, I did a presentation in Denver uh, a couple of months ago. So I wanted to bring up something that was kind of Colorado. That's just the, the Pedro mummy, mountain mummy from Wyoming. He was found uh, uh, in 1920 or something. These guys in Wyoming, these prospectors, they blew open a, a cliff. And this tall little mummy, I mean, not tall, small, a uh, little mummy was sitting there, uh, all in, inside like a little cave. And uh, I'm told, and he's only about two feet high, he's this adult, he, this was a, a real thing. And so he was x-rayed uh, in Chicago, uh, he was apparently a human, only he was only about two feet tall. And I'm told by yoga people that he's in a special yoga posture or something like that. In 1950, it disappeared. And it was known, it was, it was known to exist, but in 1950 the guy sold it to somebody and then it vanished. <laughs> and nobody has seen it since. So that's why there's a reward for it. The salmon rooms in New Mexico are kind of interesting too, because one of the things that they, they found these slab, slabs there, and on these slabs were elephants. We're part of them. Archaeologists would never figure out that. All right, let's go briefly now to uh, Colombia. We're going to go to a place called San Augustine. It's down here. I was just there. So, like the Olmecs, in really 1930s in Mexico, they just started digging up all these giant statues and stuff in this place called San Augustine. Weird statues. They were 20 feet tall. The area around San Augustine is a, is a jungle, weird jungle area. Um, these guys do, like this guy looks very Egyptian. Strange thing. Uh, uh, it's now they're at the museums. Some of them are these Gorgon guys with big teeth and stuff like that. Um, very sort of Mediterranean, Egyptian looking, oddball stuff, and very finely made, weird buildings, it's, it's megalithic, strange giant tombs, uh, and, and sarcophagi made out of basalt. This is what the whole mountain area looks like around there. It's a, it's a gold mining area, there's a lot of gold that in Colombia and, and comes out of this area. There's dolmens, uh, many, many statues. And looking at this guy here too, 
like in Bada Valley, look at these eyes. This is, as far as I'm concerned, this is, they would power tools. And uh, yeah, this, these kind of sweeping lines and, and all that is very, very well done. And a lot of these guys do are, are in sort of tiki poses and things like that. They're wearing turbans. Archaeologists are utterly baffled by San Augustine. They, they, they don't have an explanation for it. They don't know who these people were. In some cases, they have like weird jet packs and weird things on their backs. They're holding uh, strange things in their, in their hands. They often wear a very elaborate headgear and, and clothing. It's all, you know, all, here's one of the guys here. He's a cool guy. I mean, uh, he's called Spaceman. He's got a ray gun in your pocket and you're just happy to see me. Yeah. I mean, he's a cool guy. I don't know. I, 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 I just surrounded him and I thought, man, is this what really, you know, this is what these guys look like? Um, and when you go to the gold museum in Bogota, where all this gold stuff is, you start to also see a bunch of weird stuff. So you see the, now you see these guys in gold. And you know, one of the things too, when you talk about all these metals and stuff like that, I'd like to point out, all gold is indestructible. All gold in ancient times still exists today. It can't be destroyed. Every statue, every coin, every gold necklace, it's still around, but, but other metals oxidize and disappear. But some of these things that you see there in the old museum are just plain weird. I call this guy the, the fire one. I, I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> uh, you have big gold discs and things like that. Some discs like we're supposed to be at the, the Temple of the Sun. You get even things like this that look like they're calling it a rotating disc. Uh, so yeah, even something that looks like some kind of saw blade or something like that. Also on display there are crystal and uh, amber things, but these are like little crystal beads, and they've, they've, they've drilled completely through this quartz crystal. So uh, how are they going to do that? I mean, working with, you know, you're going to have, again, some kind of diamond drill to do this. And, I mean, when I go to museums all over the world, I'm constantly looking for just unusual artifacts, whether, it, whether it's a crystal skull, or uh, even, you know, things, any kind of worked crystal or hard stone and things like that. This is a statue there too. Yeah, these guys were cone heads as well. So, uh, yeah, they're very similar to, to what you see at Tiwanaku, also what you find with the Olmecs and stuff like that. This is a ceramic guy here. It was, again, very oriental. And what is also there at that museum is a display of these gold airplanes. And, uh, in fact, Giorgio uh, is, uh, legendary times, that's, this is his little medallion you get from him, this little gold airplane. So yeah, they, the, this is totally on display, it's completely real. They're at the Gold Museum, they've got a special display for them. And, and they don't really comment on it, they've got about 30 of them. But the whole thing is with these, is that they're, what the main, again, the mainstream has to address this. And they can't really be airplanes, can they? So, you know, what are they? Well, they're flying fish, or they're insects, or something like that. But that's part of the problem, too, is that, you know, fish and, and insects, and, and, or birds, they don't have tails like this. Really, only, only airplanes <laughs> have, have, a, have a tail like an airplane. So, that's, that's kind of a thing. And in fact, I mean, they have a flying fish, you know, there. So they know what a flying fish looks like, and, you know, have that in gold. Uh, but so, but they have these things that are airplanes. And in fact, the whole idea that, of ancient flight, that people were flying around, that there were airships, and before sex refreshments are going to have airships. If you go to ancient India, uh, when you read the Ramayana, Mahabharata, and other ancient Indian epics, they read like wild science fiction. People are getting in their airships, flying around. This is Rama. In fact, this is a display at the Bangkok uh, International Airport. This is Rama up here. He's on his flying. Vehicle being drawn here and stuff like that. And the whole story of Rama is that his 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 wife is kidnapped supposedly or, or runs off with this other guy and for a while Rama's bummed out and meditates in the forest for a while and he kind of jumps up one day and he says, I'm gonna go get that woman, you know. Uh, gets into his Vamana. Yeah, I mean it is, you know, the, the airships are very clearly described. Gets into his Vamana, flies to Sri Lanka. You know, you're coming home with me, Dave. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a fight. And, uh, so anyway, that, but and every every Hindu, every Buddhist knows this story so well. Right? They all know, it. and they all know what a Bahama is. There's just you know, there's no question about it. So 
what do you need to have an air? You don't have flight and machines. You need you need metals. Uh, you need electricity to have flight, uh, to have power to do all the things. And they have electricity in ancient times. We know that. Uh, you need machines. You need you know you, you need cog machines. And with the Antikythera device here, that was uh, in fact this has a date on it. I mean this was found in a shipwreck. It's found in the Athens Museum. Uh, the Antikythera device was. A, cog machine that opened up, it, it, it was a kind of a computer. You could dial up um, uh, navigation type stuff and sky charts and things like that. But archaeologists never imagined that in ancient Greece there was ever anything like this. They didn't think that they had stuff like that. And in fact, the, in the 1950s, when, the, when American archaeologists started examining the Antikythera device, they said, boy, you know, they said finding this is like finding a jet plane in the tomb of King Tut. That's what they said. And, and then later, they magically did find a jet plane. <laughs> King Tut's tomb. The, uh, so look, if you go, for instance, this is in, this is in Dendera, a temple that's also that's near Abydos. And this is depicted a number of times in, in the temple of Dendera. And uh, it, it's just totally real. So, yeah, it looks like these cables are coming out here. They're connected to a box. These are jet pillars. They're associated with Osiris. Here is uh, what apparently seems to be some electrical device. The snake and the serpent. It's interesting, we were seeing the serpents carved on their rocks and stuff, and, and Peru and whatnot. And here you have like even this baboon guy, and these little guys. The whole scene is all very strange. And it really appears that it's, yeah, what this is is some kind of lab of light bulbs or something. Maybe they're using it to light the temples, That's that kind of a thing. Well, Egyptologists have to explain this too. They have to have an explanation. And that explanation can't be that this is some electrical device. Because they could have had electrical devices. So what's the explanation? Here's their explanation. This is a lotus flower. And this is the aroma of the flower. That's, that's the mainstream Egyptological explanation. Because it can't be something that's lit. It just can't be. And that's, you know, that's how they are. Also, uh, at the Optimus Temple, which is nearby, this is up on a lintel, and this is also very real, too. This is it's about 20 feet high up, it would be like way up in the ceiling, but you can see it. And you have this thing here, which is kind of like a helicopter. Then you have kind of this thing over here, so it's sort of like coming in, and you have this thing right here, looks kind of like a jet or something. Have another thing down here. And this is totally real. And uh, the, now the mainstream explanation for this, they have to explain this too. And they actually have a fairly good explanation for this. What they're saying is going on here is that two hieroglyphs are superimposed on, on one another. And this temple is so old that it's many thousands, thousands of years old, that the priests of education would go up and they would replaster over. Uh, like a wall or something, and they would put new hieroglyphs on it. And so one hieroglyph is superposed on another one. And that kind of, for this one, that is, uh, uh, that is a good explanation for this, this is, and, and this too, because that's the arm. But what I've been told by, by archaeologists, ecologists, is that this one here, they have no explanation for this. That's not a hieroglyph that, that they know or, or recognize. So, so this thing here is totally unique, and it does seem to be like a now this is also, this is something similar, this is it's called a zoomorphic uh, pendant. It's a, it's a gold pendant, it's made out of gold. Uh, it's in a museum in, in Panama right now. It's, it's solid gold, and it has a stone that they've not really identified embedded into it. So this is what they call zoomorphic. It, it's, it's like a monster, it's, it's a pendant really, but it, and it's, it's been something, what appears to be a backhoe, turned into like a monster. All right, these are some of the views of it. It's got a skid plate up in the front. So here's a drawing of it. It's what it looks like. But what's strange is that, is that the back of it is, has these blades, and it's like a backhoe. And really, what this apparently is, is a representation of some kind of heavy machinery, of a, of a backhoe. All right? So just like Caterpillar or, or John Deere or whatever, yeah, I mean, some of they would just like we have today, and it's, it's something that makes our civilization, you know, what it is today, is having heavy machinery. And, and apparently, they had heavy machinery in ancient times. 
This was a glider that was also found in, in, uh, uh, in, in Egypt that was found in the tomb. And the Egyptologists do believe it is a, a, like a flying it's a glider, representative of a glider. This is in uh, Dasani Monastery. So this whole idea of saints and people running around, they're flying around the world. In ancient China, there are so many legends of, of people flying, people having flight, kings who have flight, uh, King Solomon, and then Queen of Sheba, the son of Menelik. They supposedly had flights, uh, and even they would fly between Jerusalem and Aksa. There's a radio here. You know. <laughs> But I'm sure this is painted on some tomb in Ethiopia. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so the whole idea too. This is a, a Syrian, Sumerian type of uh, seal. But here you go. Here's the flying disc. It's a winged disc, and you got three guys. They're flying around. So, in fact, when you read the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, uh, I mean, they read like wild science fiction. They have these horrific wars. Whole cities are being completely devastated. Everybody's being killed. Uh, they've got all these horrible weapons and stuff like that. They've got flying machines and stuff like that. Well, then, just after World War II, really, uh, British and Indian and Pakistani archaeologists began excavating at Panchagara and Rapa, these cities that are kind of right on the border of India and Pakistan. And we call this the Indus Indi Valley Civilization. In fact, this is a seal. This is a kind of a Brahma type bull. This is some extinct bull that we, you know, we don't know even what species of cattle that is. But when archaeologists got to the street level of Mahendragaro, people were just lying dead in the street. I mean, some doom had taken over the city, and everybody was dead. And then the desert came in and just covered the city with with dust and sand until. 1947, just like ancient Indian epics had said, that these cities were devastating and everybody was killed. And that's something that baffled archaeologists too. It was like, why are, why are people just lying dead in the streets in the city? And they couldn't, they couldn't explain it. It's like, yes, yeah, so an atomic bomb had gone off and just killed everybody. So the whole idea of Vishnu and all these guys flying around, Ayodhya, the whole story of Rama is that he's from this area of northern India. Those cities like Mahendragaro and stuff are out where people are just lying dead in the streets right around here. Dwarka, the city where Krishna is probably from, is down here in Gujarat. It's actually underwater. And then here's Sri Lanka. Um, tradition today more or less says that Rama uh, really came down here to Sri Lanka to, to get his wife back. So here we go. This would be a depiction of the Lamanids on the Indian temple. They know that they fly. And they're, you know, it's just literally your airplane on the chariots of the gods. But since it flies, you know, it has to be pulled by birds or flying horses or something like that. Well, here's southern India, and here is Sri Lanka, and here's what they call Rama's Bridge. And so this is a satellite photo from NASA, and what they found was that, yeah, that at one point, this, there was a, like a thin road was built, and it's now just underwater. Something like the, like the road to Key West from you know, Key Largo to Key West or something, you're driving out into the, through the ocean. And that's exactly what they found here. And so here's this road, and, and, and parts of it here are, are underwater now. You should have to be very careful. But apparently, yeah, this is a man-made thing from 10,000 years ago or something, and it's underwater. They found in the, in the Royal Baroda Library in uh, 1920, they found this book called the Vimanika Shastra. It was a whole book about Vimanas. When you read the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, or something like that, they talk about Vimanas and these ancient airships, but they don't, they don't go into great detail of you know, how they worked or even exactly what they looked like, although they do talk about different ones. It would be like reading a, a novel and then the hero you know, in the novel uh, suddenly goes to the airport and flies to London or something like that. And in a, in a novel, the author doesn't just suddenly stop and tell you what an airplane is. You know, they, they don't even know that. And that's how the ancient Indian epics read, too. But they would, um, but here they found a book that was, that was really all about the Bamanas. 
And it talks about different kinds of vimanas. There's, there's at least five different kinds. A rukma vimana, which was a, actually kind of a circular flying saucer type craft. The trapura vimana, which was more of a tubular cigar shaped kind of craft. The shakuna vimana, which was more like an airplane with, with wings and things like that. In fact, the Gomini, Bhimani Shastra and other ancient Indian books talk about mercury as part of the propulsion and, and, the, and the fuel or whatever for these pomodas, which, which is kind of unusual. And then when you look at mercury, uh, and I get into all this in my book on pomodas and stuff, mercury is for us, he's the god of flight. He's the messenger god. He travels through the air. Mercury is uh, it's a metal, it's an element, it's a liquid, it's a conductor. Mercury is an unusual, uh, shall we call it, a substance. And it can be used in a hundred, <laughs> in the caduceus. And a, part of the whole idea is that there's a, what's called a, a mercury gyro. And you can have a closed system of a gyro, you can put a mercury inside it, and it gets spinning in a, gyro, a closed gyroscopic uh, system, like a glass ball, and then you can electrify it and give it electricity, and then it becomes a plasma, which is an electrified gas. And in fact, uh, according to physicists and stuff like that, yeah, uh, gyros are anti-gravity, and, and a plasma gyro could actually lift and fly. And in fact, as for many of you MUFON people, um, would be familiar with one of the things that happened towards the end of World War II, which was called Foo Fighters. And Foo Fighters were these like glass glowing globes uh, that were that the bombers uh, would sightseeing over Germany as they were flying over Germany. And they would come to swarms, allegedly, of these glowing globes in the sky. And as they were flying over Germany. And it, it was in newspapers in, in England and America at the time with UFO investigators know it well. Um, they're, they're, they were called Foo Fighters. The Americans named them Foo Fighters because at the time there was a popular comic strip called Smokey Stoker. And in that comic strip they were constantly used saying an expression which was where there's foo, there's fire. And in, in French, foo is fire. And, and it was so Smokey Stoker. We were saying, well, there's food, there's fire. And so the airmen started calling these glowing globes over Germany at the end of the war. They, they called them that Foo, Foo Fighters. And, you know, there's even a famous rock band named that too. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, but that, those Foo Fighters, apparently, uh, as other people have written, they were also these, like, mercury gyro balls, in fact. And, if you go to Area 51, and if you leave Las Vegas and you start driving past Area 51, you'll suddenly see a highway sign to get off the interstate, and it, and it says Mercury, Mercury, Nevada. So the city in Area 51, you know, whatever, that, that Bob Lazar and everybody would go to, to work, it's called Mercury. Mercury Nevada. That's the name of the town in Area 51. So anyway, I, I mean, this is kind of just the end of this part of my presentation. I do have another one, but I, I, I'm going to stop now. Um, so yeah, the, the idea with the Vimana stuff and the, the Vimana text was was talking about Mercury. And at least at least Mercury can is, I'm convinced, is part of at least some of these, say, flying saucers. So we're going to have to leave here pretty soon, but I have, I think, just a few minutes for some questions. Some questions. Yes, sir. All right, we're just going to talk about the green glass that the archaeologist found. The which one? Green glass. Green glass. Green glass. Yeah. Okay, or like sheets of glass in the desert. So, yeah, right, right. Uh, there's areas of the desert, particularly in uh, south, uh, west Egypt, which is near uh, Libya and Sudan. And there's, there's just sheets of glass in the desert. It's all sand. And in fact, British geologists, when they first went out there, right before World War II, they were driving these land rovers out through the desert. And they, and they noticed they were driving on like, uh, 
sheets of glass. And also they call it Libyan, Libyan desert glass. And so this whole area is, is the desert has been turned to glass. And a piece of that glass actually is in Tutankhamun's famous uh, face mask. So geologists have never really been able to explain that. There's also sheets of glass like that they found in Iraq, also in India. And so, you know, the for the ancient astronaut theorist type would would be wondering, yeah, was there some atomic detonation out there and uh, a nuclear weapon went on? And that's what happened too at Al Gordo in New Mexico when they detonated the bomb there and turned the desert back to glass. So wherever, yeah, wherever you here in our country, if you see sheets of glass out in the desert, it's usually indicative of a common text. The way they try to explain that in Egypt is of a common flying parallel to the desert, but not striking. And somehow, yeah, you know, I, mean, they, I gotta ask how that's going. So yeah, some comet or asteroid is coming out of space, but then flying along the desert to superheating the sand and turning glass. That's what they're playing. Yes. Yeah. I was here for the last um, elongated skulls, and I remember those elongated skulls, they had a double row of teeth. Did you notice a double row? You know, I, I never heard that. Uh, uh, six fingers and double rows of teeth and stuff like that. Uh, I've not seen, in any of the ones I've seen, I've not seen double rows of teeth, but that is a story. One of the interesting stories like that was in Crittenden, Arizona. And Crittenden, I had to look that up, it's near Tombstone, and near Nogales. And it was an early fort that the, that the American military made out here. And they were digging a, a powder magazine there, which, which was basically a bunker. They were digging a hole so they could put kegs of powder cakes and stuff in it safely. And they found, supposedly, uh, some weird sort of guy. And in that sarcophagi was a skeleton of a guy who was like eight feet tall, and he had a double row of teeth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a, a similar thing, find like that, was found at San Luis Obispo in California, where they were also digging on this ranch, and they suddenly came to some. I mean, they, they literally find like a tomb, and then they open this tomb, and you know, this is all, you know, 1880 or something. And then they find these weird things. So they, and, and then, it, yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, the Sumerian writing. <laughs> yeah, uh, in my book on uh, ancient, uh, ancient technology and proof of Libya, I do give uh, a translation of the Puente Magna Bowl. It's, uh, it's like an, uh, it's a libation uh, to the gods. It's a, they call on Sumerian gods for, you know, for luck and stuff like that. It, it, it's nothing really like like real work uh, or, or meaningful. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. I want to follow up this question because we have some of them on the same idea of a concept. You said that the finding of artifacts within the bowl that had the Sumerian writing on it. Right, point A is The archaeologists were trying to cover that up by calling it Sumerian cover up. Yeah.
And if, uh, if you're some Siberian guy and you want to go to Peru, you're going to have to walk all through Canada and all through Mexico and walk to Peru. Because you cannot get into a boat and go there. Because oceans are barriers, okay? People, you can't get in a boat and cross an ocean. Now, and, okay, that's isolationism. That's what we're being taught, okay? And that's unscientific. It's ridiculous. That is unscientific. Oceans are not barriers, they're highways. Uh, the easy way to go someplace is to get into a boat, not to walk everywhere, okay? And in that same way, islands like Easter Island or Hawaii, Hawaii is one of the most remote islands in the world. As an island group, it's very, very remote, Hawaii is. And so is Easter Island, like that. So what, what these mainstream isolationists are saying, Polynesian people who are Stone Age, with a Stone Age culture, they can get into a catamaran with some fishing line and some chickens. And, a, and, so, you know, and they can go to Easter Island. They can go to Hawaii. They can go to Tonga and all these remote islands. They can do that. And the, and the Malaysians, they can cross the Indian Ocean and go to Madagascar. But sophisticated Asian babies like the Romans or the Jews or the Chinese or from Africa or, or, or Vikings or the Basque or I, I name them. King Solomon's ships to Mofer. They can't get into their giant ships and cross the Atlantic or the Pacific. They can't do it. Because, you know, and that's what we're being taught. In, 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 you know, it's stupid. It, it's all sorts of different. Now, the, now the, the diffusionists are the other guys. Okay, and I'm, I'm the diffusionist. And what we're saying is, and, and what diffusion is saying, that, yeah, all these cultures, like I've been showing you, they're connected. And just the, the keystone cuts and the elongated heads, that is something that has been brought to all these continents by one culture. And then all these people are repeating it. And it yeah, that, that these, and that's part of the thing too, these isolations would have to say that every one of those keystone cuts that you saw there, practically, and every one of those guys with a elongated head, in each of those places, they independently just did, did craving the same thing. So that's why, so in other words, what we're being taught, I mean, it's crazy. You go to the University of Los Angeles or Harvard or Oxford or University of, of Arizona, and your archaeology professor is going to tell you that, you know, people didn't cross the ocean from China to Mexico in ancient times. People, Africans didn't cross the Atlantic, you know, or whatever, to Mexico and Barbara Stein Hints. That, that's what they're going to say. And, but diffusionists are, are going like, whoa, whoa, what about this? What about, what about all these things? What about that French of Angola and the Sumerian right? What about that? And in fact, I, I mean, it's such a good question because what I normally would say when I'm talking about the French of Angola is that the, here's the only thing that mainstream archaeologists can do about the Fuente de Angabal and the Paz is ignore it. Not say, all they can do is just not say anything. Not, never mention it. Never put it on TV. It, it's not to ever be discussed at some archaeological meeting, you know. And that's all they can do is just not ever talk about it. And that's, and that's kind of how these cover-ups happen. And that's why I was, I'm convinced that if that had been found in Peru, pressure would be there on Peruvian authorities to not have it on display. I mean, and to me, it's the, the scene, that last scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark, where Indiana Jones says, where's the ark? You know, where is it? I want to see it. And they tell him, oh, don't worry. Top men are working on it. Top men. <laughs> And, and Indiana Jones is never going to see the ark again. And then they're putting it in that vast warehouse where no one's ever going to see it. I mean, that's the final thing you have to And that is so apropos. And you can't you can imagine how many times I have realized and, or thought that exactly things like that have happened. And part of it, too, is and would have to do with the whole thing of giants. People have been getting smaller throughout history. Everything was bigger. 10,000 years ago, everything was bigger. People were bigger too. Animals were all bigger. 
you know, there were, we were, you know, eight foot tall guys, and uh, Magno Man was taller and had a bigger brain than everything that we did. But yeah, they're running around with sabers through tigers and, you know, giant elk and huge cave bears. Everything's big. And plants are big too. And, and everything's been getting smaller over time. And in fact, warfare also makes people smaller. The wars have really made people, the, the Napoleonic Wars took the average height of Frenchmen down several inches. The French are not known to be taught that. Because war is like a football game. You put all the big guys up front and they get killed. Yeah. After, after big wars, all the tall people are, killed, are dead. That's, I mean, this is what happens. Yeah, warfare makes people, makes mankind short. Okay. And so now, and so now they have people, and every once in a while they're digging up somebody in love lock caves or something like that, and the guy's eight feet tall with long red hair. Or something. You know, and they, and that 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 will be covered up too. I mean, they, and part of the reason for that, in my mind, is that uh, what happened really in the late 1800s was that as science was coming on, they wanted to disprove. The Bible. And you know, people thought back then, and many still do today, that just everything in the Bible was, you know, literally true. And the scientific establishment at that time, that was, you know, kind of their thing was that no, the Bible's not true. And and so things that were a lot of stuff in the Bible, like giants, Noah's Ark or, or stuff, you know, the scientists wanted to sort of disprove that stuff. That it's, you know, this is religious, you know, superstition. And so therefore, when things like, in my mind, this is my opinion, you know, when things like giants are discovered, I mean, literally proof of giants, uh, and I believe there were giants, um, yeah, that the mainstream is, is, you know, they're like, oh no, no, no. We, we can't have this in our museums, you know, we, and so, and so there is a suppression. And if, and if, you know, some cave was found in the Superstition Mountains full of Egyptian, you know, tablets and Sumerian stuff. Yeah, archaeologists may decide, you know, we, we got to keep this quiet. By the way, that's another thing, too. I, you know, I'm always interested in lost treasure and lost mines. You know, Arizona is a good place for all that. And you don't read very often about find, people finding lost treasure. And there's no reason for that, because if you found lost treasure, you'd be stupid. So, <laughs> so you know, yeah, the first thing you do when you find a lost treasure is keep your mouth shut. <laughs> yeah, I, sure. Uh. Dave, i got to tell you what happened. Uh, I moved to Phoenix in the early 80s, turned on the 5 o'clock news one day, felt the strong guidance to do so. And on came a story about Phoenix. They said we were digging in downtown Phoenix parking lot for the new high rise of their building. And they found ancient Egyptian and Roman golden artifacts in downtown Phoenix. Interesting. Yeah, and actually near Tucson. Yeah. They found some too, actually. So yeah. It's right here in Phoenix. And I was so excited to hear this. And then there was never anything more about it ever again. And then also, I recently found out that the American Indian's DNA is Egyptian. Is that right? Interesting. I'll be sure. The American tribe, oh, okay. the Indian tribes are Egyptian. That's interesting. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, Phoenix is an aptly named city. Uh, this is, and, you know, and, this, and one I, more thing. Yeah. We built all these hundreds of miles of canals. Canals, yeah, right? All over Phoenix. And I was going to say, you know, that Phoenix is still using all these canals in the Hohokam. And I mean, it's kind of, and it shows you again, just to use the Hohokam as an example of how. Narrow-minded, really, archaeologists are, and and the, the, what we're talking about isolationism and diffusionism. I mean, they archaeologists want all these communities to be just isolated from each other. Or even even southern Arizona is isolated from northern Arizona. You know, I mean, and the people aren't trading and moving. If you go out to Cottonwood in Sedona, there's the ruins of Tuzikut. And I hope you all have a chance to go there. The Tuzikut ruins are in Cottonwood. And they're not cliff, you know, castle dwellings or cliff dwellings. They're, they're, they're freestanding buildings. Oh, there's a store up there in Cottonwood, you know, Your mom's store. Well, yeah, my mom, yeah, we have a bookstore up there. 
But, here, but here's my point about Tusi Group, is that, okay, down here in Phoenix is this huge civilization of the Hohoka, building giant buildings and canals and, and just rearranging all this area. I mean, they were geniuses, whoever they were, and they built a huge city and all that. And then, only, you know, a day or two days walk north is, is a place called Tusi Group. Well, when archaeologists look at Tusi Group, you would think that they might relate Tuzigu to the, the giant city of, of Phoenix, of the Hohokam down here. No, they, they don't. And in fact, in my mind, Tuzigu absolutely is a, it's there because of the Jerome mines, and those mines are ancient. In fact, people thought they were Aztec mines originally, and they found mines in, the, in those mines at Jerome. But yeah, they couldn't think, the archaeologists couldn't believe that people in Phoenix had anything to do with anything up there. So they gave the, they gave the, they just made up names for the builders. Tuzigud is built by the Sinagua Indians. Who were they? Well, nobody knows. They didn't exist. <laughs> what was their name? Well, we don't know what their name was. We'll just give them a name. They're the No Water Indians. <laughs> I mean, you go to Tuzigud today, and uh, you know, they'll say, well, this was built by the Sinagua Indians. You know, this is their, this is their well, who are the Sinagua Indians? What do we know? <laughs> there were called the Sinagua Indians. What was their name? Well, they, they don't know who they were. Oh, it doesn't make sense. It make sense. And in fact, you know, the Hohokam, it's clearly, it's all connected. And Chaco Canyon, and, and Wupaki, all those things. And by the way, there's ball courts all up there. Okay? They're importing rubber balls from southern Mexico and bringing them up here. Yes, right back. Yes. <laughs> Uh, since Linda Holmes and Howard reported on the supposed underground uh, pyramid in Alaska, you know, I, I know, she was. I, as far as I know, nothing ever came of that. And she did promote that, and there was some pyramid in Alaska. And there was another guy back in the '90s who talked about that. Yeah, it was an underground, or was that? Yeah, as far as I, I, I've heard about that. But as far as that, that thing just fizzled out and, and nothing, I believe I, 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 that nothing ever came about. I, I, it, it's something good, I'd like to know. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a question about the elongated skulls. Uh -huh. Has there been DNA testing done on those? Are they human or are they other? Well, that's, I mean, that's a good question. And you would think, you would think that people in, in Peru and stuff, they would do DNA testing on them. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, you would think that that would be done. I, I'm not aware of, of any. I knew Lloyd Pye, and some of you must have known him. He had this Star Child skull, and uh, perhaps came here for a long time. I, I knew him for years. And he was constantly, you know, going on about having his skull tested for DNA. And, and that never really happened either, as far as I know. I mean, he would talk about tests, but... Nothing, as far as I can tell. Yeah. That that seems very peculiar. With I, I don't even I did see something on the internet of in the last month where they um, tested an item that was found that was really incongruent in the area, and they said that it was over two hundred and fifty thousand years old. Yeah, sometimes when these tests are happening, and I mean, and they're kind of expensive. It's tricky. And, I, and by the way, I'm not I've not been ever. And I don't own any of these skulls, but I don't have them. But um, a lot of times when they do those tests, the labs that do them, if they find out what they're doing, they, they sometimes will back out. They, they don't like being involved in really um, controversial tests. And the one that happened recently, uh, and this was, a, this was a triceratops horn in, uh, in Montana, and this paleontologist, they, it was this fossil era of triceratops. And they noticed that part of the, the horn of the triceratops wasn't completely fossilized. <coughs> so they took, they took a sample of that horn and they sent it to a lab in like Georgia or something to be carbon dated. And, and carbon, carbon dating really only can go to about 40,000 years or, or 50,000 years. Anything 
Anything older than that can't be carpeted. But that lab, when they dated this Triceratops corn, they gave it a, a date of, of like 35,000 years old. And, you know, according to, and again, this is the whole dinosaur thing. Well, dinosaurs are all extinct 65 million years ago. That's what they say. I mean, that's not actually a fact, but that's what paleontologists tell us. So, when this lab was giving a date of 35,000 years to a triceratops horn, the paleo, everyone went, whoa, you know, this, wait a second. This can't really be. Uh, and everybody, you know, everyone gets confused suddenly. And the lab gets into trouble too. And that, the archaeologist who was involved in this, this is an article in our, in our magazine, of World Explorer, in the last issue. And suddenly, you know, this guy's whole world came crashing down on him. And he got fired from his job. They accused him of being a creationist, you know, like a young earth guy who wants, wants everything to just, you know, nothing's, nothing is millions of years old, everything's kind of young. So, young earth creationist. And he said, I'm not, no, I'm not a young earth creationist. I'm just, okay, he does, I want to, just want answers. And, yeah, and no, they, he got fired, and that lab refused to do any more testing. So, I mean, this is the kind of thing, I mean, so, yeah, when suddenly these things happen. So, I think that if a lab knowingly tested some thing like that, of a skull, and, it, and the DNA would say not human, it would almost be washed, I think. I think that's what it is. Thanks, everybody.